You know, it's always an honor to present uh, our faculty and, and really demonstrate the excellence that we uh, show across the dis many disciplines at the university. And today we're going to hear from Jason Roundtree. He's an associate professor in animal science at Michigan State University, where he holds a Charles Stuart Mott uh, Distinguished Professor for Sustainable Agriculture. Roundtree has, holds a, an extension and research appointment where his focus is on identifying the metrics and management that reflects ecological improvement in grazing land systems. He conducts his research at the Lake City Ag Bio Research Center, along with the Upper Peninsula Research and Extension Center, where he, where he also maintains a coordinator uh, responsibility uh, for, that, for that center. Since arriving at MSU in 2009, uh, he's given over 250 uh, presentations throughout the United States and around the world. He has also worked to co-develop with the Savory Institute an ecological outcome verification that is now being used on over two million acres of grasslands on every continent uh, around the world. The ecological outcome verification has also been branded for products marketed by General Mills, Applegate, and many others. Uh, Roundtree has been a co-investigator or principal investigator on $27.75 million in funding to conduct research in food systems. Uh, uh, in food systems. He will also be the director of a new Center for Regenerative Agriculture at Michigan State University. His work in sustainability has, was featured in the movie Sacred Cow, and he has been highlighted in the Washington Post, New York Times, Forbes, and many other popular media publications. Please welcome Jason Roundtree. Thank you, Dr. Gage. Great. Uh, Chairperson Byram, uh, President Stanley, uh, trustees, provost, uh, it's great to, to be here. And so um, I don't know if you uh, may have seen the news this week, but Secretary Vilsack announced a $1 billion request for proposal to work in climate smart commodities and as, to, uh, and as well um, to help create new carbon markets for agriculture. And I know some of y'all have been in the ag industry for a very long time, and so a billion dollars is a lot of money for us ag folks. And um, I guess two questions come to mind. First of all is why? And if I were to, to estimate the why, um, our farmers and ranchers in this country work very hard. Uh, they've been pushed to focus on output over input. Um, they're constantly having to shift with policies. And during that process, while we continue to produce food to feed the world, we simultaneously have seen degradation ecologically. Our landscapes uh, have become more prone to um, desertification. We've had challenges with water quality. Uh, there are reports that we've lost well over half our topsoil uh, in the United States because of farming. I never blame a farm or farmer for the actions they have to make, but it is a complex problem. And how do we address that uh, would be the second question. And, and the answer in, in, in our work is regenerative agriculture. And um, if I were to define regenerative ag, I'm just gonna use my title. It's improving the health and resilience of our land, livestock, and, and community. Um, Regenerative agriculture is really not awfully complex in terms of the adoption of principles that drive ecological resilience in our landscapes. We talk about minimizing disruption. We want to keep our ground covered in all of our farms. We try to promote perenniality, uh, living roots throughout the year, more biodiversity. We need to get more livestock back in our cropping systems. And then we also need to apply adaptive grazing. Uh, Dr. Stanley, you've walked my pastures with me, and I really appreciate you, and I think you may be can, can uh, kind of think about what you've seen and the things that we try to pr promote at Lake City. And so we really have some shovel-ready opportunities for Michigan agriculture and beyond that I think can address the challenges we have with water quality, uh, resilience in our landscapes, and also make our farmers more profitable. Uh, but before I go forward, I just want to go back for a second. I'm a Spartan. I got my PhD here. I worked in the Department of Animal Science. I coached the National Champion Livestock Judging Team in 2000, and that's kind of our Super Bowl. Um, <laughs> my wife and I are both Spartan grads. I got my PhD, my wife, an undergrad, we're Texans, 
And uh, as the gentleman alluded to earlier, we got this nice little banner in the mail this week, and we're awfully pleased um, to see that as well. So we're Spartans. Uh, we love Michigan. We miss Texas where we're from, but we, we are Spartans. And so I left Michigan State with a PhD ready to save, save the world. And the closest place uh, to Houston area where I'm from was Louisiana. And I went to work in extension. I didn't realize that um, in extension, we were supposed to be first responders to food disasters. And I would expect you all know which hurricane this was, Hurricane Katrina. We also got hit by Hurricane Rita that year in 05. And so here I was trying to do the regular research that I was taught to do and, and trying to expand uh, the U.S. Uh, beef production system. And this is what I actually inherited. Things like this. Isn't that crazy? Cows on front porches. This is actually after Rita. Uh, this person, I don't even think they got the new, uh, the, the new uh, labels off their windows on this house. And so when these things hit, and they do hit, things go south in a hurry. And I really had a reckoning mentally on, on our farming principles. And I, I love, as I mentioned, our farmers and how we farm. And I, I think we do a, a really good job and take a lot of heat simultaneously. But the point is I started thinking about resilience and how do we begin to prepare farmers and agriculture to be more resilient through these challenges? How do we take CO2 from the atmosphere and put it back into the soil? And I've dedicated my life's work to this ever since. And so in 09, thankfully, I got to come back to my second home and we're here in Michigan. And this is Lake City uh, Research Center where we do our work. Uh, we're right up southeast of Traverse City. Um, we implemented a new grazing, adaptive grazing management uh, program at this farm in 09. We quit fertilizing. Uh, we really tried to use what we call biomimicry. If you think about bison traversing the plains uh, and grazing and leaving, grazing and leaving, they may not come back to an area for a while. And what that, that recovery period does is it allows for more biodiversity, plant roots to get deeper. Uh, there's nutrients, there's manure and urine and hoof action and microbes and critters and all these things that are regenerating soils. And since we began adopting this approach, we've actually seen our beef production system. And despite what you read in the news, it's actually been a sink for carbon. And we've actually been able to publish this. Now there's nothing perfect about it. There's challenges. But in this work, I also simultaneously learned that it's awfully difficult to measure carbon and water in ecological function at scale. And so I took what I've learned at our farm over the last 10 years and I created a team and uh, we, we put forth uh, to me from what I believe to be the largest grant to be put into grass and pasture lands in the United States with an overarching goal of understanding the metrics management and monitoring of our pastures in the United States um, effectively what we're hoping to do is to measure ecological function at scale. And by doing that, and to address that $1 billion RFP that, that uh, Senate, Secretary Vilsack mentioned, is how can we bring big scale monitoring to bore to inform carbon markets, to inform ranchers? And, and that's really what's driving us. Uh, we have partners, um, Colorado State and the Noble Research Institute are, are the two partners. And we put together over 19 million the Foundation for the Future of Ag Research, Noble Research Institute. Uh, Green Acres Foundation in Cincinnati is actually the Gambles of Procter & Gamble. Uh, the Jones Family Foundation from Ann Arbor and Butcher Box as well. And so we've been working in this space. I'm actually working to lead a, a group of over 50 scientists to see how we more aptly can, can take the, the management principles and scale this up to, bi to big technology and big time data in and, and, and space. And so we're using the best technology we can. We're measuring CO2 cycling, we're measuring soil carbon, we're measuring watering with our Water Research Institute here at Michigan State. We're channeling all this data into the best known models that are out there today. We're trying to make new models and algorithms that can simultaneously, in, in almost real time, try to teach us what's happening with water and soil and carbon. And we're also simultaneously looking at the fact that we've got to understand the socioeconomics of these models as well. There's a farmer behind every acre. And, and for everybody in here, eating is an agricultural act. And so through this really integrated study, uh, we've been able to, to do some great things. And so here we are with, with the remote sensing in space, trying to tie it down into local acres and local farms. And it's also, again, I just want to emphasize the fact that while we can understand these things that drive ecological function, we have to understand the social and economic drivers 
that will adopt these principles that can give more resilience to the state of Michigan and beyond. And that is also a real driver of what we're trying to do. And so that framework for this new $19 million project and hopefully more projects to come serves as the framework for a new center of regenerative agriculture. We wanna see as many acres as possible in the state of Michigan and beyond adopted for the soil health principles and into a regenerative agriculture mindset. It isn't black or white. We hear a lot of black and white these days. This is a gradient. Life's gray, it's tough. And what we're trying to do is just get farmers and ranchers down that pathway of improving soil carbon sequestration, water quality, and water quantity uh, throughout the US. We care about the nutrient density of our food. Hypothetically, if foods are growing on healthier lands, they should be better for us. So we're interested in human nutrition and nutrient density, value chain resilience, profitability, and then really getting down to the core of what we stand for as Spartans, social ecological resilience and community well-being. I'm not obviously doing this on my own. And, and the fact that I would like to say is I believe today we are leaders and in agriculture and addressing the challenges of climate. Uh, we're working, uh, this is just the group alone from Michigan State University that are working on this project. Uh, there are folks that, that are, have newly been uh, put into the academy, as Dr. Stanley said today on, on this slide. And so we have a great team. Um, I'm certainly excited about that. And as we move forward, I would like to also thank uh, Dr. Gage. I would like to thank Ag Buyer Research. Uh, Dr. Bueller, who's now uh, over in this building, uh, but as well, uh, George Smith, uh, a colleague that I've worked with for many years, and also uh, Dr. Tyler at MSUE. I think that we are going to, to move forward as leaders. I think we have these visions of what a farm of the future looks like. Carbon neutral dairies, as well as our new greenhouses and other really important things that will help continue us to be leaders in agriculture. So with that, I'll quit. I don't know if y'all have any questions. Thanks for y'all's time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for, for Dr. Roundtree? I actually do. So yes. first of all, Dr. Roundtree, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. You're, you're speaking in an area that I have a lot of personal interest mm -hmm. in and get excited about it. And you also have two a College of Agriculture alumni on the board of trustees with Trustee Foster and, and myself. Mm -hmm. So just for a little bit of background. but. Recently, the governor released her draft climate plan, mm -hmm. and a section of it is food and natural lands. Yes. I wondered, have you looked at that draft plan? Do you intend to provide any kind of comments? Comments are allowed through the uh, middle of March this year. I helped write it. Okay. <laughs> good. Thank good, you good. for that, though. Thank well, I would encourage I, you to. I, I'm an ag guy, and I honestly, in full transparency, <laughs> wish it was a little higher up that wish list, you know. But I, I well, think Well, I that think there's opportunity, and I, and I don't believe that really in the draft plan yeah. you had individuals on the, the climate task force that had a, a deep knowledge in, in agriculture. So the regenerative agriculture and the role it can play in carbon sequestration and, and reduction of greenhouse gases is, is important. So there's that. Absolutely. And then what also piqued my interest was the using livestock as part of cropping. Mm -hmm. And what do you see as the role of extension? And I ask this because I actually have on my calendar an appointment with the dean and um, George Smith, Dr. Smith, coming up to talk specifically about that because carbon markets are one piece of it, but the other is how do you integrate livestock with cropping, more local food sources, mm -hmm. and also it adds economic stability to some of these small farmers that may be landlocked and really are looking to how to make their farms more viable. Great question, uh, Chairperson Byram. Um, Wendell Berry, longtime author, said that um, when he talked about crops and livestock, he said, we took the solution and we split it into two problems. And, and I, I tend to believe that, that when we integrate livestock back into these systems, it helps ecologically, it reduces nitrogen needs, it improves soil health, water infiltration. But simultaneously, we don't see many fences anymore in our cropping systems. Um, and so there are these wonderful technologies. We're actually working with a company that, that has virtual electric fencing as an example that are working to, to do those things. And um, we often say it's not the cow, it's the how. We often see beef on the, on the cover of, of many of our publications that, that in, a, in a negative light. And 
So I think from an extension, we need to, to educate the consumer and, and more aptly say that this is a nuanced discussion. It isn't either yay or nay. And I think as we move forward, um, I think farmers should be compensated for adopting these principles, whether it through be these carbon markets or other ecosystem services. And by doing that, if the value in that payment is greater than the opportunity cost, I think we'll see these integrations happen better. Uh, but today, as you know better than I do, farmers are tasked with a tough, tough profit loss statement every year. And so until we can get a farmer in a better place to adopt these things, I, I think it's going to be a challenge. When it comes to the small local food systems, I mean, you get in North Michigan, you see so many acres that are pretty under underutilized. I think livestock have a great tool, and I've worked a lot with Don Co, good old, good old Don Co up there, you know, at Black Star and others, as we've tried to expand those types of things over the years. And I think there's a great opportunity for smaller producers to adopt these grazing uh, animals on their landscapes. Um, there's a great demand for local food in the Travers area, as you well know, and other areas. And we do also know that for every dollar spent in beef, there's it, it normally close to like a four or five dollar multiplier. There's even work that General Mills done that would say by adopting regenerative agriculture, that multiplier is even higher. And so those things can really, I think, impact positively the economics of our state. Well, thank you. And thank you, you for your work. I appreciate it. Ken has a question. Trustee yeah. O'Keefe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Professor Rauncher, I'm interested. You were down in Katrina, and I went down there after the natural disaster and saw the water lines a foot above every house. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, what does that, a natural disaster like that do to the soil? And how does the farming community come back from that devastation? It's it's uh, tough, and we I worked on one I worked with one rancher that actually lost 600 cows in the storm. It's horrible, right? And and the fact is is that they were so far down south in New Orleans that he, the, the traffic and the, the log he couldn't get them out. So that that's one challenge, right? Is you can't get them out. And so when we saw that saltwater innovation, it, it, you know that it all came in. Uh, normally that's a brackish marsh. And most grasses are not salt, salt tolerant, right? So what happened then is that it basically kills everything. Earth is resilient. And I believe that, that, it, that being a natural system, it adapts, it, it improves. And I, I did see another story that happened is that we, we saw this beautiful Bermuda grass pop up after the storm and it looked great. And I got another call and we went out there and the, uh, another gentleman had like 200 cows that were lying dead in a pasture from salt poisoning. And the grass looked great and everything, but there, there's all these challenges. And so when you get hit with these things, there's a lot of unintended consequences um, that, that can occur. And so the, the, the ways to, to get around that is fresh water, rain, you know, you know, filtering, but I think also just trying to allow the soil to recover, to get the biology back in track. But it definitely can dramatically alter what can be planted for a significant period of time. Thank you. Other questions? So. Uh, so what a great presentation. Uh, it was great seeing you in Lake City. I enjoyed that. Yes. Y'all come visit, please. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah. uh, you know, we'll as we, you well too. As we uh, get right. ready to celebrate Founders Day tomorrow, um, what a nice way to think about Michigan State University and its right. founding and the ag roots, and to think about the kind of work you're doing where satellite photos are being used essentially to uh, take a look and really change the way we measure outcomes mm -hmm. and have ways to do regenerative agriculture. So it's a great thing. And I think the multidisciplinary approach, which involves the social sciences, I'm sure, Economic economists as well. I think again, it's the great things the multidisciplinary universities like Michigan State University can right. do. So, thank you so much for emphasizing. Appreciate that. it. Thank, thank you. All. Appreciate it. Thank you.